page 1091, Revelation 4 and 5. We're going to read both chapters. After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven a throne was set. One was seated on the throne, and the one seated looked like jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Around that throne were 24 thrones, and on the throne sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and thunder. Burning before the throne were seven fiery torches, which are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal. In the middle and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is coming. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the throne seated before the one seated on the throne, worship the one who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you have created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. And I cried and I cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, stop crying. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God set out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they'll reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honour and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This is the word of the Lord. Bit of a purple passage, isn't it? And uh, it's a bit of a corker. Uh, there's an outline there in your newsletters, some um, household questions up the top right uh, for lunchtime discussion. God willing, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end and you'll be able uh, to hopefully... Uh, go and buy a book one day by Stephen Beastie. Uh, if you can't buy a book by Stephen Beastie, that's the author of the book that Jade Hill up, uh, come and see me. We've got a few. Uh, he's made a career from cutaways. Uh, he writes and illustrates books that help you understand how things work. He takes you behind the scenes so you know what is happening now. He takes you behind the scenes 
so you know what is happening now. I think he's really clever, not just because he's a great illustrator, because he's actually worked out that humans, deep down, want to actually understand how things work. They want to understand what is going on now. Now, sometimes we like to leave that at a shallow level. Sometimes we like to dig more deeply. But especially when we come together as a community, we'll often ask, oh, what's, what's happening? Why is that taking place? Why are these things going on? And we often want to use that to explain the world we live in and what is happening. In Revelation 4 and 5, we get a cosmic cutaway. We get a cosmic cutaway. We're taken behind the scenes and the curtains are pulled back so that God's mob can see what is now so they can be a faithful witness. Let me pray and we're going to look at that together. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for its goodness. I thank you for its clarity. I thank you for its colour and power. Father, thank you that you speak to us through Jesus to John in a letter about what is And we pray that this will explain, encourage, exhort and confront us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Revelation, if you remember from two weeks ago, is what's called an apocalypse. So that's a really complicated Greek word that just means making clear. At the heart of Revelation is the making clear of the faithful witness called Jesus by a faithful witness called John to the people of God so they can be a faithful witness. Revelation is of Jesus by John to the people of God so they can be a faithful witness. A faithful witness is very clear. Dan helped us understand that last week. A faithful witness is proclaiming and practising that Jesus is Lord that Jesus is Lord and Saviour. It's proclaiming to the universe that there is a boss and someone who has fixed up the world and he's coming back soon. And the proclamation and practice doesn't wander from that truth. And just as we heard last week and the week before, because Jesus is victorious, those who persist in him will be victorious as faithful witnesses. John's received this vision while he's in isolation if you want, exclusion on a little piece of rock in the Mediterranean. And as Jesus speaks to him, he says, John, write down what you have seen, what is and what will take place. Last week, we saw John write down what has been. Jesus speaks about the seven churches, about all of God's mob, about how they have lived how they've existed, it's always relevant. As as Jesus confronts and comforts his mob, it's a moment of searching self-examination. A moment of searching self-examination. There are three risks. There's the risk of assimilation or joining in with the world. There's the risk of persecution, the world piling in on you. Or there's the risk of complacency where the world is so good that you get distracted. Uh, Jesus speaks these words so that God's people are examined, encouraged, confronted and comforted. If need be, they need to repent. If need be, they must persist. After this, point two on the outline, after this I looked and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. And I'll show you what must take place after this. After Jesus has spoken about his mob, John looks, and the same voice that has already been speaking to him, the voice of Jesus, chapter 1, verse 11, speaks again. Hey, John, come up here. Hey, John, come up here. And I'll show you what must happen after this. So if what's been spoken to the seven churches is what was, What John is about to see is what is, and it always will be. Whenever you read this part of the Bible, it's in the present tense, and it is certain. Immediately, John is transported, point three on the outline, into heaven. 
Uh, you can use all sorts of images about this. He's taken behind the scenes. The curtains are pulled back. It's a cosmic cutaway. He's in the cockpit of the universe. Whichever one it is, John is being shown what is going on in the big picture. Immediately I was in the spirit, and there in heaven a throne was set. One was seated on the throne, and the one seated looked like jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that looked like an emerald surrounded the throne. Around that throne were 24 thrones, and on the 24 thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbling and thunder. Burning before the throne were seven fiery torches, which are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne was something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal. Uh, in the middle and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and in back. There's a throne. On the throne is one. The one is not described physically, but described in terms of gems and lights. Uh, you are meant to shade your eyes. A rainbow surrounds the throne. Around the throne is the whole council of heaven. From the throne comes lightning and rumbling and thunder. Before the throne is the complete spirit of God and there's a separation between this throne room and everything else by this huge transparent sheet. It's pretty awesome, this imagery, isn't it? Uh, the imagery is familiar. If you've listened to Isaiah 6 or perhaps read Ezekiel 1, it's all the same language. God is not using a secret code here. The imagery is a statement of faithfulness. The same thing that happened on Mount Sinai is happening constantly in heaven. The imagery speaks very clearly. There is a throne and it's occupied. There is a throne. It's the throne of power and of judgment like every throne is and that Throne is occupied already. And there are four mind-blowing creatures there too, aren't there? Uh, they are bizarre. Their wings covered in eyes represent all the pinnacle of created beings and they don't stop speaking. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God the Almighty, who was, who is, who is coming. The one on the throne is unique. There is no one like him in the universe. The one on the throne is powerful. There is none more powerful than he in the universe. The one on the throne is eternal, no beginning or end, always. On the throne sits, well, we're finally given his name, aren't we? On the throne sits God, and there is no one like him. And as they keep talking, every time they talk, the 24 elders do something too, don't they? Uh, they start speaking as well, kind of like this huge chorus in verse 11, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you've created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. Uh, God, you are unique, there is no one like you and you have exercised this by creating and sustaining. No one like you, no one like you. It's worth pausing at that point and considering what John has written as he's in exile on that piece of rock. In exile on Patmos, under the guard of Roman soldiers in an empire ruled by Domitian who demands to be acknowledged as God in a region where there is competition to show your loyalty to this God, immense social pressure to acknowledge the real power in the world, John is shown what is. Cosmic cutaway, there is a throne and there's already someone on it. And let me tell you, his name is not Domitian and his name is not John. Our world is littered with thrones, isn't it? We all have our own throne and there are all sorts of powers that claim thrones, in this case Rome, but there is only one throne and there is already one person seated on it. Our world is full of social pressures to conform Social pressures that will beat you down. Social pressures that will lull you into security. But there is only one who is significant. In a world where Rome says we provide peace, water and roads, all you need for life, only one creates and sustains. In a world that clamours for devotion, 
where interests claim your desires, where communities demand your loyalty, only one deserves worship. And that's God. And John has just seen him. And then he sees something striking, point four. Look there at chapter five. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on the inside, on the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who's worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. And I cried and I cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Point four on the outline in the right hand of God is a scroll covered in writing, front and back, sealed with seven seals, complete document. Uh, An invitation is issued to the living and the dead. Uh, Anyone worthy to open the scroll? Notice that it's not an issue of power, it's an issue of worthiness. Anyone worthy to open the scroll? No one comes and John breaks into sobs. We're meant to capture those breathless sobs. No one can open the scroll. It's a confronting scene. Uh, It's meant to be confronting, and the scroll lies at the heart of it. Many views about the scroll. Uh, In one commentator I read, 16 different views. Uh, But I want to suggest that it's probably not that complicated. Uh, It's God's plans. God's promises and the plans to bring them about. God's promises and the plans to bring them about. Uh, God's promise is very clear. I'm going to reverse the curse. I'm going to deal with the damage that humans have wrought as they've set up their thrones against God. I'm going to deal with the separation between God and humanity because of human sin. I'm going to deal with the judgment of death that was rightly brought by God himself on rebellious humans. The scroll is the promise and plan of God to bring that to fruition. And so you, you kind of realise why John's sobbing because if no one can open the scroll, then what's happened to the plans and promises of God? And you can understand why John might feel that sitting on Patmos. He's looking out, he's in isolation, he's guarded by Romans, he's separated from family and friends and community. And he looks out and he goes, oh, what's happened to the plans and promises of God? They're so grey and dusty, they're so inadequate. They can't be implemented. What use are the plans and promises of God? And then do you notice that someone speaks up in verse 5? And one of the elders said to me, stop crying. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. John, don't cry. It's similar to that comfort that Jesus showed John earlier when John came face to face with Jesus as he truly is. John, stop crying. There is someone worthy. Have have a look at him. Uh, In fact, before you look at him, uh, uh, let me describe him. There's a lion over there. Uh, We all know lions, don't we? We all know what lions are like. None of us want to meet them. In fact, the throne of the king of God's people was made of lions. It's a picture of power, 1 Kings 10, 19 to 20. And that lion is described in two ways. It's from the tribe of Judah. We, we know the genetics of this lion, Genesis 49, 8 to 12. It's from a particular tribe in the family of God's people. And we know furthermore which part of that tribe, the lion is the root of David, Isaiah 11, 1 and 10, where we're told that someone from that mob, someone from that root will save the world. And do you notice how the line is also described? He has been victorious. The line isn't coming out for war. The line has fought the war. The line has won the war. The line is victorious already. That's why this line is worthy. Because the victory has already happened. And so John, John does as he's told. Can you imagine that? Look, let me describe. And so you start looking to see what's described. You're looking for a lion. You're looking for someone magnificent. And then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. 
He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne and you are meant to be confounded by the mixed metaphor. You are looking for a lion and a lamb walks in dripping blood in the throne room of God. You are looking for a magnificent king and you see a slaughtered sheep walking in to the throne room of God. And John knows this lamb. John's already written about this land in John chapter 1, verse 29. Then the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, here's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's already written those words. John's already met this Lamb. John's already written about them in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, uh, I'm the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. This lamb, this lion, his name is? It's Jesus, isn't it? This lamb and this lion. Jesus who lived, died, and rose for the sins of his people. This lamb, this lion, is descended from the family of David, born in Bethlehem, who holds the key to everything. This lamb and lion has already won so the scroll can be opened. Already won because he's beaten sin and death. Can you imagine how John feels as he reads and sees and writes that on Patmos? How central the historical truth of Jesus Christ is the victory that has already been won for the present reality of God's rule. Rome rules. Rome has killed Jesus. In Rome, the local communities and families put pressure on you. In Rome, the good life is so attractive. In Rome, there is this truth. The tomb is empty. The lion who is the lamb has walked out and spread his blood in the throne room of God and he is victorious. And John sees that. John sees the wonder of it. And the lamb takes the scroll. And and immediately there is this rolling thunder of voices that build and build and build into this massive crescendo. Verses 8 to 10. The four creatures and the 24 elders all bow down and sing a new song. I look there in verse 9. They sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe, language, and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God. They'll reign on the earth. The victory of the lamb lies in his slaughter. where his death pays the price for the sins of God's people. And it creates a people that can now relate rightly to God, who come from every tribe, language, tongue and nation, who then speak God to the world in all those languages. Lies in the fact that people saved by Jesus will be on the right side of history. And then the choir expands, if you like. And we actually see all of God's messengers join in. In verse 12, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And you meant to go, I've heard that before, haven't I? That's Revelation 4.11. So what they're singing about God, they now sing about the lamb. God and the lamb, God and Jesus are the same, divine both seated on the throne, and then the whole universe chimes in. Do you see how it builds? Every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, everything in them say blessing, honour and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The Lamb is worthy to take the scroll because he's already won. The Lamb is worthy to take the scroll because he has been slaughtered and created a people for God who represent God to the world. The lamb is worthy to take the scroll because he's God himself. And so those plans and promises of God, we're now going to see them unfold as the lamb opens the scroll and we see how those promises are implemented and we know it will happen now 
because of the truth that the Lamb's already been victorious. At every point in Revelation, we need to remember this has been written so that God's mob can be a faithful witness. I'm at point six on the outline. It is about the faithful witness, Jesus, by a faithful witness called John, so that God's mob can be a faithful witness. It is about the clarity of Jesus. Uh, And John has been given a cosmic cutaway, cockpit of the universe, curtains pulled back, shown what's behind the scene, and he sees that there is a throne. He sees that there is God. The throne is occupied. He sees that God's scroll can be opened by the one who has already won. And because of that real truth now, God and Jesus deserve everything. So how do these verses help God's mob to be a faithful witness? That's the question we've got to ask about every part of Revelation. And you'll see four suggestions there at point six on the outline. Uh, Here is an explanation of what is. Now, if you do a survey of human history, kind of like an intellectual history of humanity, you'll see that our history is littered with explanations. We're constantly desiring to explain what is going on, aren't we? If if you just handle an area that I'm mildly familiar with, you've got something like Marxism or communism that says everything is about what is material, about labour and about how you divide stuff up. And then you move into what we've got at the moment with liberal democracy in a free economy, and there the explanation is the individual and what they make of their lives. And then you move more into our world today, and you see that the clamour of explanation is about the authentic and taking advantage of every opportunity. All of them are attempts to explain how and why the world is. And every time humans try that explanation, they throw up all these options, the dollar, labour, conspiracy, the individual, opportunity. John's just been given the explanation, hasn't he? What is? This is it. God's on his throne. Jesus is Lord of life and death, and the promise and plans of God are coming to fruition. Here is the explanatory key, the grid for everything and all that is. So I suppose once we recognise that, we've then got to ask, do we believe it? Do we believe this is and this is the explanation? Not only do we believe it, do we use it? Do we offer it? Do we pass all of our experiences through this throne room? Or do we offer alternative explanations? This vision is a reassurance. Uh, At the heart of the cutaway, the cosmic cutaway that John is shown, is this historical truth. Jesus has won. That's why we can say today, Jesus wins. It's always present tense, but it describes a certain concrete historical fact The blood of Jesus was spilt. His life, death and resurrection has beaten sin and death, which means God has already delivered. No Roman emperor, no good life, no peer pressure, no community ostracism, no isolation or rejection, no banishment from society or social media, No persecution, nothing will change that truth for God's people. There is a throne, there is one seated on the throne, and that is established in history. Are you reassured? Are you reassured? It's also a moment of confrontation. That's the third way this works for us to be a faithful witness. Uh, One of the striking things about this vision is whatever is on the throne is the thing worshipped. Whatever is on the throne is the thing worshipped because whatever is on the throne deserves recognition. Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? What's on the throne? It's a moment of self-examination, isn't it? God and Jesus are already on the throne. And so they deserve everything. That's the word worship. They deserve everything. 
Here is the faithful witness to who God and Jesus are. They deserve everything. They're the key to understanding what is. They deserve all worship. For God's mob, that revelation is confronting. Do they get all worship? Do they get all worship? Do we give God and Jesus what they deserve? Conversely, as we saw last week, does our practice reveal something else? It's a moment of searching self-examination and it equips God's people to be faithful witnesses. The vision that John is given equips him for their faithful witness. It confirms for them what is the centre of the universe. It assures them of the reality of what has already been won. It sheds light as they look out on the world on who deserves devotion, honour and significance. It reminds that there is already one on the throne despite everyone else's aspirations and one only holds the power of creation and over death and sin. It exposes pretenders and it assures that the promises and plans of God will definitely happen. Those are all the truths of the faithful witness, aren't they? Are they the truths we share? Are we equipped to share them? Or do we share alternatives? Let me pray. Father, thanks for this cosmic cutaway. I thank you for showing us what is. Uh, Father, thank you for taking us uh, through what you show, John, into the throne room of the universe. I thank you for explaining. Thank you for encouraging. Thank you for confronting. And thank you for equipping. Uh, Father, if we need to repent, please enable us to do so. Uh, Father, if we need to be encouraged and reassured, please strengthen us. Uh, Father, if we need to be emboldened, uh, please equip us so that what is will be proclaimed in Narrabri this week. In Jesus' name, amen.